from Bovard Auditorium at the University of Southern California. Welcome to the 2021 induction ceremony for the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the Academy, Sarah Gallant. I want to welcome you to the 12th induction ceremony of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare. Although the year's been challenging, this is a time of celebration. We'll do our best to make this as lively and meaningful as we can. We're excited to celebrate the work of 12 leaders in social work and social welfare. The Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare has had a very strong board this year, which has allowed us to be even more active than in the past. Our mentoring program for junior scholars, for example, is very strong, with 29 mentors and 51 mentees participating in 2020. Also in 2020, the Academy presented two webinars that provided open discussion on the issue of systemic racism and its effect on mental health and on poverty, and participated in two other webinars on racial equity with NASW and the Social Work Leadership Roundtable. We've contributed to four resolutions and white papers in support of anti-racist education, canceling federal student debt, community-based emergency response, and condemning herd immunity as a response to COVID-19. The Academy also signed on to a joint letter with NASW and CSWE supporting a fellow for a position in the Biden-Harris administration. And we published a commentary in JSWER on COVID-19 and long-term impacts on tenure line careers. Sadly, two board members are cycling off this year. As you may know, board appointments are for three-year terms. Our outgoing board members are Nancy Hoyman, our vice president who's led the mentoring program, and Jorge Delva. They've contributed significantly to the academy through their board work and will be missed as board members. I would ask them and the rest of the board to stand at this point, but then you wouldn't be able to see them. That's COVID humor. They will be toasting our new inductees virtually at the end of the induction ceremony, however. We also would like to recognize our nominations and elections committee for their work. Cynthia Franklin, who chaired the committee, Ron Manderscheid, Mary McKay, Cheryl Zimmerman, Laura Abrams, Jill Barrick, and Liz Lightfoot. And finally, we'd like to thank Joanna Scott and Swan Nguyen from the Suzanne Dvorak Peck School of Social Work at USC and the Trojan Event Services for orchestrating this event and doing the filming. We will be presenting a panel titled Pandemic, Inequalities, and the Long-Term Ripple Effect Across Junior Faculty Trajectories. It will feature four of our Academy board members, Audrey Shillington, Nancy Hoyman, Paula Narayas, and Jorge Delva. Good evening, my name is Audrey Shillington, and I am the Dean at the College of Health and Human Sciences at San Jose State University. And I am so thrilled to be part of this panel this evening as part of this celebration. I'd like to introduce my fellow panel members. And I will start with Dr. Paula Norias, who is the Grace Beals Ferguson Scholar and Professor at the University of Washington. I also would like to introduce Dr. Nancy Hoyman, who is Dean Emeritus at the University of Washington School of Social Work. And also Dr. Jorge Delva, who is Dean at the Boston University School of Social Work. The paper that we wrote and this panel is focused on the impacts of multiple crises that we have been walking through over the last year. Uh, particularly, we were interested in those impacts on junior faculty. We recognize that um, these multiple situations, crises, challenges that are in place have, impacting, have been impacting everyone. So we know that, that there have been ramifications for staff, for senior faculty, for students, uh, family and friends, but really this paper and this panel is focused on the unique uh, disproportionate impact that 
these have on our junior faculty. And specifically, as we all know, we've been walking through a global pandemic for a year. We have also had an economic crisis that has rolled out in the shadow of that pandemic as there have been closures across the country and across the world. Also keen social challenges and crises that have happened across the country because there are inequities related to economics and health that have been amplified and highlighted and spotlighted through this economic and through this health crisis that we've been living through. And then finally, not to forget that we also have been living through a crisis of democracy that there has, through this past year, has been one of the most contentious election cycles and even since the election uh, that many of us have seen in our lifetimes. And so the panel is going to look at, discuss, and think about the ramifications of all of these layers that have been in place and how those layers impact the types of roles and responsibilities that our junior faculty have related to their research, their teaching, and their service to their communities and their institutions. So Nancy, I'm wondering, can you tell us about the history and what the rationale was for the Academy's mentoring program? Yes, I'm very happy to do so, having been involved with the mentoring initiative for over three years. And one of the most important contributions that we can all make as fellows is to support younger generations of scholars which seems very appropriate since many of us, certainly me, is at a generative phase of life. And the program was initiated in 2018 um, with the focus on providing the opportunity for junior faculty to learn from prominent leaders in the field. We primarily targeted smaller programs uh, in part because they typically have less research infrastructure and fewer research mentoring opportunities. Uh, the first round of the program had 26 mentees and 25 mentors. And in the second round of the program in 2020 had 48 mentees and 32 mentors. So you can readily see the program has grown and you can readily see that many mentors had to take on two or three mentees. And we're very appreciative to all of you who did take on more than one mentee. When did this year's survey of the mentors and the mentees take place? And, and can you talk a little bit about how that corresponded with when COVID was really impacting our country? Absolutely. So the survey was uh, administered in June. So about three months after most universities had closed. Um, and we, we found the response rate was slightly lower than in 2019. In 2020, we had a response rate of 50 of 63% of mentees and 20 37% of mentors. In 2019, it had been 58% of mentors and 71% of mentees. So there was a slight drop, which I'm sure is, was due to people being extra busy because of COVID. So Paula, I'm curious in terms, you also had a role with uh, the mentorship program, the leadership of that program and uh, the survey and data collection and, and analysis. And so I'm curious from your perspective in turn for mentors specifically, were there also some other kinds of things that stood out to you and that from the feedback from the mentors? Yeah, and let me um, step back and uh, give something of a just a thumbnail sketch here. Mm -hmm. I did want to just acknowledge, we've already identified the nature of the sample, but as we go through, we want to be clear that we well recognize this is not intended as nationally representative of our uh, junior faculty and social work, but our findings did come at a, an inadvertently uh, important time so that we were able to identify um, some confluence. Uh, as you were just mentioning, the mentors and mentees had been reporting very positive um, 
relationships and sense of satisfaction along the way. And then um, things, the survey really illuminated a lot of challenges, both, and this was in the early phases and we've seen even more since then, time and uh, effort costs. Um, the shift was very apparent with both the mentees in terms of it, it hampering their time and capacity to be responsive to their mentors around writing schedules and so forth. With the mentors also were reporting being very distracted and beleaguered. They were needing to shift into new leadership roles uh, that around helping to navigate their schools, their parts of their universities through these very unprecedented times. So I, I, We've gotten a clear sense that there's an investment in the program and each other. Most of us have been continuing work with our mentees along the way since um, the last number of months. But uh, there are also a number of different disparities in terms of the, the outcomes that we were finding for different ones of our junior faculty that we might want to um, comment on after we can get some perspective from you, Jorge as a dean and leader in terms of what you are seeing in terms of your faculty, the mentor's capacity and so forth. Thanks Paula, thanks Nancy for the overview of the survey and Audrey for the overall introduction of our, of our work and um, it's a pleasure to be here. The, what I have uh, experienced and noticed is that the mentoring at least of, of faculty to junior, senior faculty to junior faculty or administrators to staff, uh, continues to exist and people are doing it, but the, it's, it's the, the uh, level of energy that that's taking is incredibly more than we've all uh, experienced before. Or, and, and we have to, have to dig deep. People are just tired, mm -hmm. exhausted, and not just physically, right? Emotionally, mentally, spiritually. What I haven't found in, in, is a decrease in, in being there for for one another. Now, I've also served as a mentor on, in this mentoring program, and I have noticed with the people I've mentored, there has been a little bit more distance. With their, our more immediate circle, it's, it, it remains, but it remains where we are tired. People are tired. So I said, Dean, I'm concerned, concerned about how can we best be there, but then also how can we best recognize that work that people are doing, this emotional labor that we're all invested mm -hmm. in, and that I think um, has implications also for uh, women, for for parents, and for uh, BIPOC faculty. And so those are some of the thoughts. I have more, but I, I don't want to uh, take over the, that part of the conversation. Uh, uh, back to you, Audrey. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yes, I agree. I have seen all of the things that you highlighted just now. Uh, so Paula, I was wondering, we, we've talked about the mentors for a little bit, but I also would like to now move it and shift a little bit to talking about the mentees. Yeah. Jorge pulled out a number of things that he's observing, but I was wondering in terms of the survey data, were you also finding some of those things? Are there other things that kind of came up for you? So part of what our mentees were, were describing were some of these different um, factors that were beyond their control. And they were having, uh, they were quite engaged with their partners and their faculty colleagues, but there were, there's just, there was so much that was needing to pivot that sometimes the research capacity could not be at the highest priority. And that then is really um, hampering and complicating what they can and can't do. In terms of the uh, qualitative feedback that you saw from the mentees, what would you say were the sort of the key standout types of challenges recorded in the area of the research? Part of what we're, we found with our the surveys, but also we're just finding generally is that there's a considerable variability across our junior faculty in terms of how um, the pandemic and these other social conditions are affecting them. Some they're affecting considerably, some much less so, some can pivot in different ways. So um, we're, we're seeing that some colleges um, are providing one year extensions of promotion and tenure clock, some two years, but um, 
one of the things we suggested in the paper was that we, especially we kind of senior leadership, will need to be able to hold on to this context for not just the immediate, but for some time to come, because there's going to be reverberations. This is the anxiety that I uh, felt we were picking up in the qualitative is it's worrying me now, but it's worrying me because I can't really, I can't really catch up quite in the same way that I might have in ordinary circumstances. And the uh, suggestion of having a statement in the promotion packets about describing the context, describing what was in play and so forth will be important. But also like two, three years down the line, we'll need to be able to have some historical referent so that as we're comparing uh, profiles of our faculty and some have had just very different experiences, how we're going to meet the challenge of equity in terms of expectations, but practical reality and equity in terms of context and what. So I think those were some of the, um, some of the key most palpable worries that were generated by the, the mentees. And I was appreciating that Jorge and others who were involved with the paper were giving some thought in terms of um, at a policy and process level, procedural level, how do we deal with this? Um, it's going to be uh, rely on us to make some decisions about how to manage some of this variability among our juniors. Paula, I was just wondering, I know we've kind of talked about some of the um, sort of gender and, and race pieces that came up in the data, but I was wondering, were there any sort of things that you wanted to amplify in terms of um, the BIPOC faculty and if there were specific things related to sort of research or the research trajectories that um, either were you know, called out by the participants or as you were reading the data, it kind of crossed your mind that would be important. You know, and I'd like to kind of think aloud uh, with Jorge on this because of his leadership role and broader, broader perspective. But I do, uh, I do, feel that part of what we saw was this overarching um, message that this just isn't sustainable, uh, you know, because of the sort of stacking of the needs to, uh, of the ways in which their research was differentially affected, at least among our particular respondents, there was a good bit more community engaged uh, research projects, but I think also the requests on their time, some of it's informal, as we're saying students or, um, or different groups, um, and some of it's more, more formal in terms of providing consultation or some messages and so forth, that uh, there's both an important distinctive voice, a set of voices that we wanna have heard, but it all comes uh, at a cost. I think we're gonna be looking at the need for, for, do we think some of our mentoring or some of our ways to be able to be responsive to faculty who are in these situations? I know Jorge, you've um, been articulate in some of the different um, commentary that you've provided in terms of how to be thinking about some of these disparities, but also where we go from there. And I don't know if there are some observations that you have. As a dean, my, my challenge is how do I get my community to think about now that we're valuing this, but how does that translate that we all say this is important? I'm glad you're doing work. <laughs> doing community participatory research silently is so important because how are we to know anything if we're not listening to the experts, people who have the lived experiences, is how do we translate all of these uh, new experiences and the additional mentoring people are doing and the centering of, of oppression and anti-racist work in our classrooms? How do we value that now in our promotion and tenure in our search committees evaluations, when we do the external letters that are we able, our minds to shift from this, I'm so glad you're doing this work to when we're reading it and evaluating it and assigning points or this voting whether someone will be promoted or not, or whether we should hire that person. Or if I'm writing an external letter where I whether I recommend that person for promotion and tenure, is our thinking manifesting itself in how these criteria are are, should be shifting, should be uh, 
thinking more broadly about how we evaluate a person's value uh, as, a, as a faculty. And I think that's the next stage of our development. The points that you have brought up are very important. Uh, when we think about tenure and promotion, uh, there is so much weight that is put in place for you know, your age factor, impact numbers, number of publications, number of, you know, extramural funding dollars that you bring in, um, particularly for the really hyper-competitive academic institutions in that environment. Um, so this may be an opportunity for all of us to sort of step back and, and ask ourselves, are there other equally valuable, maybe less, less numerical ways that we can think about contributions that we are making. And what is, how do we define real impact, right? I mean, there's the impact factors, but are there things that faculty are doing that are really changing the world and making a real difference that maybe don't come as easily quantifiable as some of the more traditional ways of um, measuring. So one of the things I've kind of been musing about is, and I'm gonna use the word glue for lack of a better term, but just that idea of those, those hallway chats, that sense of belonging. And I'm gonna use the word glue because that's sort of one of the best words that I can think of. but. One of the things that happens, particularly for people in their first couple of years, three years as a junior faculty or a new person in, on a faculty is that they build those relationships and those connections. And we've talked about that in the context of developing your research, but I also am concerned about our junior faculty missing out on those, let's go get a cup of coffee. We've done, we've had a few informal meetings where it's uh, it's been have, have an informal coffee time on a Friday, 9 a.m. with the dean. And I've done that with staff. And at first I thought I would get hundreds. I didn't get hundreds. I got 15, 17 people. And it actually was really lovely. It was intimate. And, and it was uh, come as you come and go, essentially as if we set up uh, pastries here in, 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 the, in a common area and just come as you will. And that was kind of fun. We did that with faculty. Few, few, few people attended and that was lovely. I didn't continue because it's interesting. I was intentional initially and then I forgot, then I got busy. But this conversation is reminding me of the importance of doing that in, intentionally. We, we are needing to send the message that you matter, we matter. And here's how we're going to kind of work within our limitations to be as, um, as outward as possible. And sometimes, you know, our junior faculty um, are quite technologically savvy and will have ideas that don't occur to me. Um, but I, I agree with the point completely. We need to be very clear about that glue effort. That concludes our panel for this event. I want to just express my great gratitude to the co-authors for the paper and my um, co-panelists here. I have learned so, so much and it has been such a pleasure. And I just wanna again say thank you to Drs. Delva, Hoyman and Narias for their participation and um, willingness to make such great contributions to our field. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And very best wishes to all the new inductees. Yes. Yes. Congratulations. The moment that you've been waiting for, the induction of our new fellows. They could not be here with us in Los Angeles for obvious reasons, but we'll be showing photos of them with their Academy Medals, which we sent to them earlier, while I read a brief biographical sketch on each. For the sake of time, I'll give you only a hint of their accomplishments. Amy I is Professor of Social Work at Florida State University, where she's affiliated with the Colleges of Medicine and Nursing and the Institute for Successful Longevity. Dr. I's cross-disciplinary research focuses on physical and behavioral health, aging, disparities, 
trauma, human strengths, and spirituality. She's a fellow of the American Psychological Association, Association of Psychological Science, and the Gerontological Society of America, and a John A. Hartford geriatric faculty scholar. Dr. I was a representative from academic settings to the 2005 White House Conference on Aging. She's led multiple projects funded by federal, state, and private foundations. She's a recipient of the Outstanding Science Award and the Distinguished Health Psychology Award from the International Association of Applied Psychology. Her book titled Assessing Spirituality in a Diverse World includes work from over 40 international scholars from different disciplines. David Albright is professor and the Hillcrest Foundation Endowed Chair in Mental Health Research at the University of Alabama School of Social Work. His research focuses on health promotion among vulnerable populations, Army veterans, and underserved communities. Dr. Albright is the principal investigator for the VITAL Initiative, a research implementation and training initiative aimed at improving the health and well-being of Alabama citizens. The community-based project extends across Alabama's 67 counties. Dr. Albright holds multiple gubernatorial appointments in the state of Alabama, advising policy for vulnerable citizens. He's been recognized for his excellence and in innovation in teaching and curriculum design and received the Outstanding Commitment to Advising Award by the University of Alabama. Catherine Cubbon is professor in the Steve Hicks School of Social Work at the University of Texas at Austin, where she serves as Associate Dean for Research. Dr. Cubbins' research focuses on applying epidemiological methods to better understand social inequalities in health, ultimately to inform policy. She was an NIH Health Disparities Scholar from 2001 to 2006, and since 1997 has served as a coordinating committee member of the Spirit of 1848, which is a focus of the American Public Health Association that operates really at the intersection of public health and social justice. She's the PI of an NIH training grant to increase diversity among health equity scholars in heart and lung disease. Dr. Covens was awarded the Diane Donito Peer Faculty Mentor Award from the Steve Hicks School in 2019. Renee Cunningham Williams is an associate professor at the Washington University in St. Louis Brown School of Social Work. She served as its inaugural associate dean for doctoral education and the director of the PhD program in social work. Having begun her career in the Washington University School of Medicine's Department of Psychiatry, Dr. Cunningham Williams has continued her research focused on the epidemiology and comorbidity of problem gambling, substance use and abuse, and mental and behavioral health, particularly among black emerging adults. Her publications have recently shifted into the area of doctoral education quality, capacity development, and experiences among doctoral students and faculty of color. NIDA has supported her pre-postdoctoral transdisciplinary training program in addictions research, which is nearing its 20th year of continuous operation. Elizabeth Farmer is a dean of the University of Pittsburgh School of Social Work. Dr. Farmer's work is dedicated to improving systems and services to more fully and adequately meet the needs of youth and their families. For the past 35 years, she's focused on youth with mental health disorders, particularly youth who are served across multiple sectors of the child serving system. This work has included epidemiologic services and intervention focused studies supported by funders at several levels. Dean Farmer's work resulted in the development of an evidence-based model of Together Facing the Challenge, or TFC, that's now implemented in TFC programs across the nation. Her ongoing work focuses on working collaboratively with community partners to improve systems, policy, and practice. Colleen Galambos is the Helen Bader Endowed Chair in Applied Gerontology at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where she directs the Office of Applied Gerontology and conducts research to understand and address health, social, community, and service needs among older adults and their caregivers. 
Dr. Galambos has served as Editor-in-Chief of Health and Social Work and the Journal of Social Work Education. She served on numerous boards and advisory committees, including NASW and the Missouri Board of Nursing Home Administrators. Dr. Galambos has received numerous awards, including Milwaukee Business Journal Women of Influence Award, University of Missouri Sinclair School of Nursing Honorary Alumni Award, and an NASW Pioneer Award. She's a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America. Barbara Jones, is University Distinguished Teaching Professor, Jocelyn and Francis Lockhart Professor of Direct Social Work Practice and Associate Dean for Health Affairs at the UT Austin Steve Hicks School of Social Work. At Dell Medical School, she's Chair of the Department of Health Social Work, Associate Director of Social Sciences and Community-Based Research in the Livestrong Cancer Institutes, and Distinguished Professor of Oncology, Population Health, and Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. She's a founding steering committee member of the UT Austin Center for Health Interprofessional Practice and Education. Dr. Jones is a fellow of the National Academies of Practice and Social Work, the past president of the Association of Pediatric Oncology Social Work, and a founding board member of the Social Work in Hospice and Palliative Care Network. Charles Lewis Jr. is the founder and director of the Congressional Research Institute for Social Work and Policy, or CRISP, a nonprofit organization that works to engage social workers with the U.S. Congress. He's an adjunct professor at Columbia University School of Social Work and a member of the 13 Grand Challenges for Social Work Leadership Board. Dr. Lewis was Deputy Chief of Staff and Communications Director for former Congressman Ed Towns when they oversaw the creation of the Congressional Social Work Caucus. He was an adjunct professor at USC Suzanne Dvorak Peck School of Social Work and a member of the faculty at Howard University School of Social Work. In 2017, Dr. Lewis was selected as the Macro Practitioner of the Year by the Association for Community Organization and Social Administration. Michael Lindsay is the Executive Director of the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research at New York University, the Constant and Martin Silver Professor of Poverty Studies at the NYU Silver School of Social Work and an Aspen Health Innovators Fellow. At NYU McSilver, Dr. Lindsay leads a cross-disciplinary team of researchers and practitioners committed to creating new knowledge about the root causes of poverty, developing evidence-based interventions to address its consequences, and rapidly translating their findings into policy. He leads a working group of experts supporting the Congressional Black Caucus Emergency Task Force on Black Youth Suicide and Mental Health, which created the report the Crisis of Black Youth Suicide in America. He's a distinguished fellow of the National Academies of Practice and Social Work. Kurt Organista is a professor in the School of Social Work at the University of California, Berkeley. He conducts research on HIV prevention with Latino migrant laborers, is editor of a book titled HIV Prevention with Latinos, Theory, Research, and Practice that was published in 2012, and author of Solving Latino Psychosocial and Health Problems, Theory, Practice, and Populations, published in 2007. He serves on the senior editorial board of the American Journal of Community Psychology. From 2004 to 2008, Dr. Organista served on the Office of AIDS Research Advisory Council at the National Institutes of Health. From 2010 to 2015, he was principal investigator of a grant from NIAAA to develop and test a structural environmental model of alcohol-related HIV risk in Latino migrant day laborers in the San Francisco Bay Area. Dr. Organista is a trustee of the Latino Community Foundation. Kristen Slack is a professor in the Sandra Rosenbaum School of Social Work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she was an affiliate of the Institute for Research on Poverty and the Institute for Clinical and Translational Research. She served as the director of the School of Social Work and the chair of its PhD program. 
Dr. Slack has served on the Federal Neglect Research Consortium, the Children's Bureau Quality Improvement Center on Adoption and Guardianship Advisory Board, and the Policy Committee for the Society for Social Work and Research. She's conducted research in three primary areas, the interconnections among child protective service systems and other systems, the link between various forms of economic hardship and child maltreatment, and the evaluation of policies and programs designed to prevent maltreatment or to enhance the safety, permanency, and well-being of children in public child welfare. Dexter Voison has served as Dean of the University of Toronto's Factor in Wintash Faculty of Social Work and the Sandra Rotman's Chair in Social Work since 2019. Dr. Voison's scholarship illuminates the impact of structural, neighborhood, and public violence on the life chances and behavioral outcomes of urban youth and the factors that protect youth in the presence of such adversities. His latest project is a book titled America the Beautiful and Violent, Black Youth and Neighborhood Trauma in Chicago, published by Oxford University Press in 2019. A licensed psychotherapist, he has more than 28 years of post-MSW clinical experience in the areas of substance abuse, adult psychopathology, and adolescent and family therapy. Dr. Voison presented the Carl A. Scott Lecture at the annual meeting of CSWE in November. I congratulate all our new fellows. We have a big year ahead of us. This is my last year as president of the Academy, Mary McKay, who is dean of the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis, will be taking over. So let's celebrate this evening. Members of our board have a few toasts for our fellows. I am both privileged and honored to be able to welcome you as a fellow to the American Academy for Social Work and Social Welfare. I look forward to working with you and collaborating with you in the important work that is facing us. Congratulations. This is to wish very best congratulations to each of the new fellows. You are the very best, the cream of the crop, we're going to expect an awful lot of you now that you are a member of the Academy. So, good luck to you. Congratulations, 2021 fellows. And I also want to encourage all of you to send in those nominations next year and have a great celebration. Congratulations to all the new fellows. It's really a pleasure to see you. I'm so sorry that I can't be there in person, but, I want to extend my best wishes to you and hope that as times get better, we'll have a chance to congratulate you in person. Congratulations to our 2021 fellows. I hope you will find being a fellow as satisfying as I have. And I welcome you and encourage you to get involved in the many exciting initiatives of the Academy. Again, warm congratulations. Hello there, and welcome to the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare. Being elected to the Academy is an acknowledgement by your peers of the contributions that you've made to society at large. Your induction also serves to honor the social work profession as a whole and its core mission to advance social justice. Congratulations on your induction to the Academy's class of 2021. From the University of Washington, congratulations to our 2021 fellows. We warmly welcome you to this academy and look forward to working with you on some of our committees. All the best. Cheers. Congratulations, 2021 Academy Fellows. We're very proud of you and honored to have you join as members of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare. Cheers. I have the privilege of first and foremost saying congratulations to our 2021 cohort of fellows. You are amazing scholars, tremendous colleagues. Congratulations on all your accomplishments. Dear friends, as a board member, I am honored to welcome you to the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare. Congratulations and cheers to all of you.